So then Max Tegmark comes along and he says, okay, well, in most of the cases in reality, you don't actually find yourself in a sort of uh, Schrodinger's uh, death chamber. So you're not going to have your life rest upon a qubit, and therefore you shouldn't really take quantum immortality uh, so seriously, it seems that he implies. But um, I, I think that entire notion of distinguishing between uh, your life resting on a qubit and not resting on a qubit is confusing. It, it, it confuses people because the main confusion is that people fundamentally believe that they are on separate tracks. They are on train tracks, which will dump them into oblivion. Like there are different tracks right here, and you are fundamentally a separate person, and then at some point you just get dropped, and there is nothing more. You are a finite line segment as opposed to an entire just infinite line or a Hilbert curve or some other mathematical object. People refuse to believe in other mathematical objects to identify with besides line segments. And that's the crux of the issue here. Um, it's that people believe this. And, and so Ma Max Tegmark, when he says this, seems to create the idea that there is a separate magisterium of things, with one in which you have uh, people locked in uh, a quantum suicide scenario in which the box gives you a 50-50 split, and then there's a rest of life in which you know, you're, you're a complex thing and death is a gradual process. And he's right. He's right about that. Uh, but he still kind of gives the wrong idea about it. He implies that, therefore, quantum immortality, you shouldn't really think about it. He seems to imply that. So I think that the better way to uh, explain this to people, because I think that Max Tegmark might un actually understand it, but he uh, didn't explain this to people correctly by bringing that uh, sort of expression, that expression that death in general is different from a, a, a sort of quantum death because all death is quantum death, and all life is quantum life. Uh, the, the, the actual way to explain, the better way to explain it is to say that death just doesn't exist in the people that, in the way that people imagine death, as in there was cessation of experience through traveling through one of these paths. Instead, there are just different mind configurations all of them exist, all of them are, uh, there is no time in the first place because that would violate special relativity. Um, and so you have all these uh, mind configurations themselves not precisely, um, I I'm drawing shapes here, but you must understand that shapes also aren't uh, precise, solid, unitary objects because then that would violate quantum mechanics. And either quantum mechanics is wrong, or perhaps our intuition about being unitary consciousnesses, which are in a, in a precise, bounded, finite location, is wrong. Either or. Quantum mechanics is wrong, um, or it, it's just an illusion that what, what, what we feel about being in a precise mind configuration as opposed to another. In any case, the, the better way to explain the sort of quantum immortality thing is that you have all of these mind configurations, and some of them are just way more related to others. They're just closer. They, they just are, are far more um, similar. They're more similar, and they're more causally connected. Like one reliably across the entire universal wave function statistically creates more of this insofar as it makes to, to say creates. Th there is a statistical relationship here that doesn't exist from this to some other one here where it's very tenuous. It exists, it exists, but it's far more tenuous. 
Um, and you know, here maybe it's like this. It's got some, but it's not as thick as this one. And then we find ourselves within this thing in which there are interrelated configurations. Some share more in common with others, and that's it. So in the sum existence, right? In the sum existence, what you're trying to attain is success. You're trying to attain success. Um, and however you define success, you have to take into account probability. You have to take into account what is going to dump most of your experiential mass into that particular configuration that you want. Okay, so then if you are all experiences, then what's the point of um, anything? Well, I don't know what's the point of anything, but the one thing I wouldn't still do is to go out and buy a lottery ticket. I would not go and buy a lottery ticket because even though I actually do win, I win in a smaller fraction. So I care about what is the vast fraction of me going to experience, not what some tiny fraction over here is going to experience. Because you, you have to really take on this uh, eternalist view of it all. What is the vast majority of you going to experience? It's going to be that which just corresponds to the usual statistical averaging out of all the quantum processes into a Newtonian picture, something which is very commonsensical, something which is commonsensical. What, you, what common sense would tell you is going to happen is actually what is going to happen for the vast majority of time. Now, quantum immortality in the sense of attempting suicide and it continuously not working, that is a bit different than the lottery because that's actually playing on the edge of non-existence. And since non-existence is actually impossible, it's a different consideration to attempt quantum suicide for strategic reasons than to attempt um, than to attempt buying lottery tickets for strategic reasons. It makes no sense to buy a lottery ticket expecting to be rich, even though you do become rich in some region of the universal wakefulness. Now, with suicide or anything like this, just in, in general, it, it's impossible to actually be non-existence. But it is possible to reduce the sort of connectivity between from one configuration, say this configuration, is that point which uh, gets, in the, gets in the sort of uh, Schrodinger cat box. And, and therefore, you're, you're going to blow up half of the time, and half of the time you're not then what you're doing is whatever this mind configuration is, whatever causal processes it would have led to are going to be very different by the very fact that you are engaging in this sort of uh, treacherous behavior against this mind configuration. Now this mind configuration is going to have causal relations with something else, something very different from what from what it would have had it uh, not done that, had it not got into that box, now it's going to have causal relations with something very, very different. And so it's, it's just a matter of where do you want most of the measure of your sort of um, informational closeness to go to? Where do you want your informational closeness to lie? Do you want some? Do you want eternity to contain more of something like this, or do you want eternity to contain less of something like this? The question of where does my consciousness go um, doesn't really make sense because at the end of the day, it's it it was always my consciousness. It was always just this. Uh, this which is which exists existence is everywhere that it is uh, it doesn't really make sense to separate it from consciousness to think that it is a sort of little uh, particle of awareness that is floating that is moving across these different things uh, again the, the notion of time violates special relativity 
So you are actually not ever traveling like a little particle zipping across configurations. Uh, there is every single configuration just existing from its inside and everything else that you might uh, think is an illusion. Or there's also the, al the alternative that physics is just wrong and everything is wrong and solipsism is true, in which case only I exist because this is too freaking crazy. 